this morning, Father, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, sorrow comes to steal the joy of
conquered it all. And we give you praise this morning, Father. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Father. We worship you, God. We just ask that you help us to walk in this authority that you've given us, Lord God, this authority and this power that you've blessed us with because we are your children. Give us that confidence, Lord God, to walk with you daily, to never put you under a shrub, to hide the light you've given us. And God, we ask now as your word comes that we would be changed. It would change us in, it would change us going out. And God, we just want to honor you and we want to bless you. We worship you in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. As we have already worshipped in our singing at Willowdale PC, we also worship through our giving. And we want to give you an opportunity to keep giving to the cause of God. Online giving is available, and it's really easier than ever to do. Just go to our website, willowdalepc.com, and click on the Giving tab in the right-hand side. And under Push Pay, click Give Here, and you can give any amount. Just follow the simple instructions to give. It'll take you less than two minutes, and it's a very secure way to make your donation. For those who don't have access to the internet, please share with them that they can drop off their tithes and offerings here at the church in the office mail slot by the front door. God bless you, and thank you for your faithful giving. Christmas and Happy New Year, Willowdale PC. I'm Maxine, here to bring you your announcements. We've had such a blast with our Treehouse Adventure Kids, and we are so excited to announce that we're gonna resume this season with more games, more Bible stories, and just a lot more fun this February 2nd. So please mark it in your calendars, February 2nd. Our mission of the month is the Citrillo family in Uruguay. If you wanna learn more about the family or support them, please visit our website, willowdalepc.com. Prayer is a huge part of what we do here at Willow LPC. So come January 7th, we'll be starting back up our weekly Friday prayers on Zoom. For more information, visit our information desk. Well, the new year is coming up, so please visit our info desk to get your very own personalized number offering envelope. January 23rd, you really don't want to miss it. Mark it down on every single calendar that you have that we have a special guest speaker. So join us at 9.30 a.m. See you there. Well, that's all the announcements I have for you guys today. I really hope you paid attention to the announcements and wrote down all the important dates. 2022 is going to be an amazing year and we have so many fun events. So let's lean in and dive into God's Word today. Good morning. How are you doing today? That's it. You can do better than that. How are you doing today? I know it's cold. I know it's chilly. But that's okay. That's okay. I woke up in my life and walked out on the balcony in Labrador <clears throat> and my nostrils froze together when I breathed in. It was minus 40. So we can handle this, right? Amen? Yeah. We're all in this together. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, you may have noticed that our fearless leader, Pastor Blake, is not here again today. Man, this man has had an interesting week, to, tell, to, to say the least. <clears throat> so it began with him traveling back uh, to Kenya with Julius and their three boys to assist them. As you can imagine, it's hard to do uh, a flight that's, uh, I'm not sure, I think it's 20 plus hours, 100, not 100% sure how long it is, but with three young boys. And so uh, when, when they traveled over here, Christine went over and flew back with them to help. And so this time, Pastor Blake went with them to help. Well, when they got to Turkey, they ran into, uh, I think, a once in a generational snowstorm. If you can imagine that in Istanbul, the, the roof of the airport actually collapsed and closed in. So they stopped all flights in and out. So Pastor Blake, uh, Julius, and the boys uh, were held up in a hotel in southern Turkey. Uh, if you saw the pictures on Facebook, if you follow him on, on, on social media, you would have seen it look like he was on a vacation. He was not on a vacation. They were in a, a hotel room, and it was cold. It, it looked like it was tropical where he was. There was palm trees and everything, but it was about four degrees. They didn't have sufficient heat in the hotels because 
Uh, as you well know, it's quite unusual to have a snowstorm in Turkey. And, uh, and so they had some chilly days, but they were blessed. They had internet. They had things. I've been talking to Pastor Blake. I got a message from him this morning saying that he's in Frankfurt on his way home. And so keep him in your prayers. Let's get him home safe. Amen. And, uh, and just even talking to him this week, you know, I had a video call with him earlier this week, and they're in good spirits. The kids are, you know, happy, and Julius is happy, and, and uh, you know, dealing with these issues like someone in the body of Christ should. Amen? But I'm going to tell you, if I was in Turkey, and, I, and they said, we're going to put you up in a hotel, and they put you in a hotel that's 850 kilometers south of where the actual airport is, that's a, that's a bit of an adventure. And so hopefully in a few months, when this all settles down, he'll be able to tell you this story with a smile on his face. <laughs> uh, so just, just pray that he comes back and that he rests up. And then uh, I'm so excited to have him back next week, as you can imagine. And so uh, when he comes back, just welcome him and bless him and uh, bless his family as well. Amen? Amen. So my sermon this morning is entitled, uh, The Need and What's Needed. Oh, by the way, that's why I'm preaching this morning. It's kind of hard. <laughs> It'd be kind of hard for him to do that from Frankfurt, I would imagine. Although in, in the, that would have been so cruel of me. No, you're preaching today. You're going to have the Zoom in from Frankfurt at whatever time in the day it is. No, I'm just kidding. But I'm, I'm preaching today, obviously, and my sermon is entitled, uh, The Need and What's Needed. And we're going to look into 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. And for some of you, this may be a very familiar story. It was for me. Uh, but just let's, let's just uh, listen to this brief account, but I believe a very powerful account this morning, and uh, I believe that God's given me a word to share with you today. Amen? Amen. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, the prophet Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead, and you know that, the revere, that he revered the Lord, but now... His creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons, then brought the jars to her, they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me one another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Father, we thank you for your word today. So blessed, Lord, to be able to pick up your word and read it every day and let it pour into our heart and our soul. And Lord, I I just pray, O God, that today we would receive this uh, word in our heart as an overflow of all the word that we've poured into our heart this week, O oh God, that we would receive it, apply it to our heart, and allow it to change us. Let your Holy Spirit do your work through it and by it. And I just pray that you would bless us, Lord. Give me clarity of thought and speech as I present your word today, O oh God. Help me to present it with the anointing you placed on my life to do this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think that most of us, when we read this first verse, you know, we can relate somewhat. I don't know about you, but I've been in debt before. I think we've all been in debt before, you know. It says, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he is revered by the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Now, thank God, I mean, if we're in debt, I don't have to give up my child. I mean, we're in a bit of a different day today, and everybody can say amen to that. But in that time, it, it, it was a little bit different. But I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, I've had student loans. I've had, you know, house, house mortgages. I've had, uh, I still have car, car payments. I mean, anybody with me? Is it just me? You know, we've all experienced some debt in our life. We've all tried to figure out ways 
uh, maybe in our younger years in particular, and how to, how to work around it. I think back to our, our first few years of ministry, my wife and I, I don't know how in the world <laughs> we paid our bills sometimes. But God is faithful, man, and we have so many testimonies, and we're so thankful. I don't think that there is an adult alive that hasn't dealt with it in some way or another. So this woman's husband was uh, a God-fearing man who was part of the company of prophets, which was believed to be ancient Israel's equivalent to like, um, almost like a Bible college, as it were, uh, of which Eli Elijah and Elisha were likely uh, professors, per se, or they would have likely been instructors there. Uh, this man left his family with debt. I'm sure that wasn't his intention, but that's the way it goes sometimes. And in ancient Israel, it was well understood, according to the law, that if someone could not pay debts, they, or in this case their family or her sons, could be hired or enslaved as payment for their debts until the year of Jubilee. And everybody say, thank God, that's still not a law. Amen? Exodus 21 and Leviticus 25. You can check that out for yourself if you like. So the woman had a legit concern, and Elisha would have known that the only way for this woman to be able to keep her sons was to pay her debt. That's it. It's the only way he, they could have figured it out. Elisha's first two questions set up the stage here, I believe, for a great miracle. And I think these two questions, although simple, are very important. And if the woman answers these questions differently, if she doesn't answer these questions or respond to these questions the way she does, she answers them dishonestly, it is likely that she does not receive the miracle that day. And you may say, well, that's a bit presumptuous. Well, I think the Bible, if you look at Scripture, uh, I think it's a pretty fair assumption that if she didn't answer these questions as she did, she likely would not have received her miracle that way. So he asked her very simply, how can I help you? It's the first question. And then he follows it up by, tell me what do you have in your house? These questions display Elisha's desire to help and his attention to stewardship. But it also displays this woman's willingness to contribute to her own solution. And I think that's very important in this, pas in this uh, passage this morning, in this, this talk that we're having this morning. She didn't have much to invest. In fact, she said, your servant, I don't have anything. I don't have nothing at all. There's nothing in there. There's nothing in my house. There's nothing at all. Except, she said, a small jar of olive oil. I'm going to tell you right now, if I got left with a small jar of olive oil, I'd probably starve. I don't know what, I, I know you can make flour and do some things, but I mean, just a small jar of olive oil, what, what's left, right? So she's probably thinking, I don't have much to give. I don't have anything, really. Just a small, small jar of olive oil. We can sometimes allow the idea to creep into our minds that, you know, we don't have enough. Sometimes we can allow the idea to creep in our minds that, that we are not enough, that we don't have anything to offer, that, that we have nothing of use, we have nothing of value. But God can bless, and we need to understand this this morning, that God can bless what little we have. Amen? And I hope, and I'm sure many of you in this room right now have testimonies of how God has blessed what little you've had, and, you, and you've had some of those great moments. I remember my first Christmas married. And literally, <laughs> my wife and I had a budget of, I think, like $30 to get a tree and decorate it. And we said, we cannot go over this. We found a tree for, I think it was $15 or $20. I'm not 100% sure, but it was almost perfectly round. Like, it was like, whoop, and then kind of up like this. But for whatever reason, we fell in love with that tree, probably because it was the only one that we could afford. We brought it home, and then said we had like 8 to $10 left. Uh, to, to decorate the thing. So we walked across the road, down the road a little ways to a, little, a Dollarama, and we found these, these felt bows at Dollarama that had a little wire on the back, and they were like so cheap, we could get like 20 of them, I think, for, for $1.50 or something. So we, we got as many of these bows in different colors, and I remember thinking we got these deep purple ones. We had the red and green, and we bought the deep purple ones because we could. And I was just like, man, they just don't look right. But anyway... We have still to this day one of these bows that we put on our tree every year to remind us of that blessed Christmas because what a fun Christmas we had. What an amazing time we had. God bless us in many ways that there, there's testimonies I could tell you about that Christmas, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll stop right now. But God can bless what little we have. Amen? And he blessed us with memories. He blessed us with, with joy and thankfulness at that time. 
whether it's talent, whether it's experience, whether it's finances, no matter how big or how small, resources of any kind. And of course, uh, you know what? The biggest talent, or the biggest thing we can offer above all things is our willingness. Our willingness to do what God asks us to do. Our willingness to be available. Our willingness to just step out and do what's necessary in a moment. Elisha's response would have been stretching for this mother, to say the least. Uh, he instructed her to go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. And I'm kind of shocked that she doesn't say why. There's no why in this. If you were at my Christmas Eve service, you know, uh, at the Christmas Eve service when I spoke, I talked about how, you know, Zachariah, when the angel Gabriel came to him, he asked why. Even Mary, you know, asked why, but she doesn't ask why here. She just goes and does it. And I'm pretty amazed by that. Then he told her to go inside with her sons and pour oil into all the jars. And she did just this. And when she ran out of the jars, she to fill, the oil stopped flowing. Now this account is not new to me, but it's amazing how sometimes you open the Bible and, and you read it and, and new things jump out at you and new ways of looking at it, new avenues to explore. And the question that kept, I kept asking myself when studying this passage this week and uh, in the previous time studying is what did the widow really need and what was needed of her? What did she need and what was needed of her? I think we are all generally aware of our needs, but for some reason we tend to be less aware of the resources we have already been blessed with that could help meet the need. Sometimes we don't ask God to bless what we already have. Sometimes we ask God to back the truck up to the house and give us what we need. Sometimes we're not aware of the need, of the resources that we have that God can use to meet our needs. The first and obvious answer uh, to these questions as to what did the widow really need and what was needed of her was that, well, first of all, very simply, she just needed help. She was in a desperate situation. She was in a bind financially, and she called on Elisha, a faithful prophet of God, to help her, and he would have had a, a good reputation in this way, I'm certain. She asked for help, and Elisha did not push her aside. He helped her. It's a very simple phrase to think about it, that she needed help and that Elijah helped her. But, but I mean, there's so much truth in this for us today, just to be able to help somebody. She asked for help and Elijah did not push her aside. But as mentioned earlier, he investigated a little. He asked her some questions to see, you know, uh, where she was in the situation. May not appear to be detailed investigation, but when he asked her what she had, I believe he was checking to see if she would be honest. He was checking to see if she would be willing to invest in her own situation, her own solution. Would she be willing to do what was needed of her in this situation? Elisha determined rather quickly that it was a legitimate need, and he, was, he responded in kind. And I think as believers, we can be in danger sometimes of overcomplicating help. We get into our heads and we think about help in different ways and it's easy to do. It's easy to complicate help in this day and age. Elisha saw a legitimate need and responded. And uh, I, every time I think about something like this, I think about my daughter and I love my daughter and I love that she has such compassion and where Carrie Ann and I can uh, slide so quickly into skepticism. Anybody else? Anybody else a little bit of a skeptic like me sometimes? No? Okay. All right, I'll, I'll talk to God about that later and repent <laughs> profusely. And you guys can instruct me on how to... I'm just kidding. I was walking with my daughter the other day to uh, a grocery store in a neighborhood. And it's more than one time that this happened. And she, the first time she saw, I'm not sure if the person was homeless or if they just couldn't pay their bills or why they were sitting there asking for money, but they were sitting there asking for money. And I could see my, my daughter just like, she was just... Didn't know what to do with it. She's like, why is she sitting on the ground, Dad? What's she doing? And I said, well, I said, she might not have a home. She might not be able to pay her bills. She might not have something to eat today, but she needs help. And, and she's like, well, where does she sleep? Where does she eat? I said, I don't know, Brookie. I don't know what to tell you. I said, I, I, I'm not 100% sure. I said, maybe shelters, maybe outdoors, maybe tents. I don't know. Maybe it depends. Maybe she has a home and she just does, can't afford to eat. I'm not 100% sure. 
And Brooklyn's response was, we, we need, I mean, and she emphasized, she says, we need to help her. There was no other solution. I mean, in her mind, I mean, my beautiful daughter's mind and her compassion and her heart, she's like, we need to help her. We got to figure out how to help her. And she was willing to empty my pockets and her own to do it. More mine, less than her own. <laughs> I remember one day, we had to walk back to the house and get something. I mean, we were, we were, uh, we're only about five, ten minute walk, but we had to go back to the house, and she had to go get money from her money. She said, I need to help her. And we walked back to the house, got her money, and then walked back to the store. That does my heart good, by the way, as a dad. I'm very proud of her, but I'm a little bit harsh on myself because I'm, I mean, why am I not that compassionate? Why do I have to overcomplicate help so much? I mean, I remember as a pastor, you know, in Surgeon Falls, we were right on Highway 17, our church was, and, and we would get hitchhikers constantly. And, and I, I remember thinking to myself, God, I'm so, I'm like, I don't know if these people really need money, if they're trying to play me. There were so many people, and some of them, I'm telling you, had agendas, they knew what they were up to. Uh, I mean, even to the point where we gave gift cards at times, and I would go to the grocery store, and they'd be trying to sell it outside the grocery store. And I had to get to the point where I said to Jesus, I said, God, if you tell me, if, you feel, if I feel in my heart that you want me to do something here and I help these people, I've got to let it go. I'm not going to overcomplicate help anymore. I'm going to give it. I'm going to bless it in Jesus' name, and I'm going to leave it with them. And I'm going to just thank you for speaking to me, and I'm going to do what's necessary. We overcomplicate help sometimes. And I'm not telling you not to be a good steward. I'm just telling you that sometimes if someone needs help, just help. You know, we just, I would just believe sometimes that we overcomplicate it. I have learned from my daughter not to judge all the, all the reasons someone needs help, but to respond in compassion. We can do this and still be good stewards. I believe this with all my heart. So the widow needed help. But the only way that the woman uh, could have received this help from God was to ask for it. She needed to ask. And uh, we are told in Scripture to ask in Luke 11, 9 and 10, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this passage, is ask and it will be given you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Now we all obviously understand that this verse doesn't tell you that if you ask for something, God's going to give it to you. Otherwise, we probably all have Lamborghinis in our driveway, right? No? Or whatever, Amen. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't mean that, you know, some people can read this and think that God's like this magic genie that we rub the lamp and poof, we get what we want. It doesn't work that way, but it does tell us to ask. We are encouraged in more than one place in Scripture to ask. Come, don't be afraid. If you read, I believe it's Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about the fear that we approached, you know, Mount Sinai when Moses w went up the mountain, that if even an Israelite touched the mountain, they would have died. The fear that they had to come before God. And then we talk about how, then they talk later in the passage in Hebrews 12 about how, you know, now when we approach Mount Zion and others, when we approach Jesus because he's gone into the Holy of Holies and he's made a way for us to approach him by, by shedding his blood on the cross, he's made us welcome. He's asked us to come just like he asked us to come in the, in, into his presence. He says, come and ask me. I'm here. I want to be with you. I want to walk with you. I want to provide for you. He says, come and ask. Come and ask. There are times when we do not receive miracles simply because we do not ask. God can't be bothered with that. Why would he be bothered with that? Well, he is bothered with it. He knows every detail of your life. And from the simplest need to the greatest, he cares about it. And he has miracles waiting for you if you just ask. I believe it with all my heart. We sang about it this morning. We open our mouth and miracles start pouring out when we ask for them. I believe it with all my heart, and I believe, you know, I have a history and a, and a life of parents with faith, and I can stand here and tell you miracles that I literally witnessed with my eyes because we asked. Again, I think about my kids. Any parents, young kids, know that all the ailments and all the calamities and all the things that could possibly happen to a child in this world come upon them when they put their heads on the pillow. When you put them to bed, they need a cup of water. You put them to bed, their stomach all of a sudden miraculously gets a stomachache. Am I the, you got parents of young children here? 
you know, Daddy, I got a headache. My daughter does not go to bed where she does not get up every night 15 minutes later and comes and, and tells me about an ailment and I need to pray for her. And I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> but over the year, over the time, it's changed a little bit. And I'm trying not to resent it because I love that my kids come to pray, <laughs> come to ask me to pray. But it's not, Daddy, can you pray for me anymore? I told him, I said, I, said, I tell him now, I said, I said, Brooklyn, Oliver, I said, you know that you can pray for yourself. I said, when you're lying in bed and you feel stomach ache or you feel something or you're having trouble to sleep, you can talk to Jesus. I want you to talk to Jesus first. If you haven't talked to Jesus first, don't come talk to Daddy. And so now the conversation goes something like, Daddy, I prayed, but... I still got a bad belly. But I love that the conversation has changed. I love that my kids know that when they feel something, when something's happening in their life, I want it to be their first reaction. That when something in their life, when they're older, now when they're younger, if something comes up and they need to deal with it and they don't know how to deal with it, I want them to ask Jesus first and then me. I want them to ask Jesus first and then the bank. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I want them to ask Jesus first and then their friends to help. You know what I mean? I want, I want them to ask Jesus first because I believe there's miracles waiting. And I want my children to experience miracles. I want them to see them. I want them to know that God heard and that he answered. I love that when my kids ask for miracles and they don't receive it, their reaction is to double down. It didn't happen, so I'm getting mom or dad to pray. That's how I was. I remember when I was a kid, well, not a kid, I was about 18 years old, and I was home from university for a semester, and I, we were at our cabin, and I was on the top bunk, and it was like 3 in the morning, and I had a migraine, and I didn't know what to do, and I don't know if I was rustling around, but my mom knew to come. She just knew, moms, I don't know how you do that, but if your kid is awake, somehow you know there's something going on there. And she came in, and she didn't say a word. She laid her hand on my chest. And she prayed, and she asked. And I went to sleep, and I woke up the next morning with no headache. And I'm glad that I have parents that believe in miracles. Amen? If you have parents that don't believe, I hope you have friends and if you, don't, if you don't have friends, that, then ask Jesus until you see it, because I believe he's got miracles for you. But then there's times that we ask and we receive an answer, but keep praying because we don't like the answer we get. We pray and we pray and we pray, but if, if God gives us an answer, praying more is not going to change his mind. Sometimes we've got to take the answer and say, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe telling you to use the resources you have. Just put it to use and let, watch me bless it. Sometimes we ask and we ask, and God is showing us something that we already have that he can bless if we would only stop waiting for the specific miracle that we believe we deserve. Imagine the miracles we miss because we are waiting for uh, it to be wrapped up and sent to our house like Amazon, you know? Ring on your doorbell and send you a picture on your phone. Your miracles arrived. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? God may have shown us a little bit of oil that we have that he can make into great provision, but we sometimes just want the truck to pull up to our house with the jars already full. God will use, but is not limited to. Let me be clear about that. God will use, but is not limited to what we have, the resources, talents, gifts, etc. We may not think that they are good enough to use, but we need to trust God with what little bit of oil we have. She also need, she needed help. She needed to ask for this help. And she also needed to act on it. I don't know about you, but I ask myself this question. How many jars would I have collected? I get a little bottle of olive oil. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what little is to you, but I think little is smaller than this. 
and the jars that she would have collected probably would have been, a, I don't know, at least <laughs> in the little felt pictures that we used in Sunday school when I was a kid. All the jars that they, they had on those pictures that we had in Sunday school were about that tall. <laughs> so uh, they would have been bigger, jar, bigger jars, like something that you would have stored something in. How many jars would we have collected? I think about that. How many jars would I have gone out and collected? What would I have expected to happen? She expected God's provision. I believe this with all my heart. She knew Elisha was a man of God. And she must have had a strong faith in God as well. Think about it. If someone asked us to do what Elisha asked her to do today, would we be so quick to respond? If we expect a miracle, and, and so we should, should our actions not back that up? If we have needs that require a miracle, should we not uh, also do what is needed to, on our part, to make sure that we make space for that miracle in our life? Yes, God parted the Red Sea, but he asked Moses to put the staff in the water first. Yes, he sweetened the water at Mara, but he told him to throw the little stick in first. You know, for crying out loud, he asked Noah to build a boat in the middle of dry land when they hadn't even experienced rain yet. you got to make room for the miracle. In this case, the widow was asked to offer what she had, but also to provide the vessels to hold the blessing. You know, we are, we're not only sometimes uh, asked to, to provide what we have, whether it's little or, or, or much, it doesn't matter. In God's hands, he can do whatever we need him to do. He can be there for us. But we're also asked, you know, to provide the vessels to carry the blessing. To provide the space in our lives to carry the blessing, to carry the miracle. I remember when, I, when we were in, in Sturgeon Falls, we used to heat with wood. And I told you before that I've experienced minus 40. I've seen frost on the inside of my windows when it's been so cold. And we, get that, we used to get that wood stove cooking, just hot as we could. And so the first couple of years, we relied on the wood because we, we didn't have a ton of money. to. to we only had baseboard heating in our house beside, and that was crazy expensive. And so we needed to find wood and we needed, I needed to find somebody who could sell it to me cheap. <laughs> Let's just be real. I needed to find, and I, and I wasn't having much luck. And I was, you know, I said to God, I said, God, we need wood for the winter. I need to find somebody who can sell it. And that's what I asked him. I said, show me someone, show me a deal. Like I'll buy whatever I can find, but show me something, you know, give me, give me an opportunity where I can buy wood cheap. There's nowhere, I mean, to get a permit and stuff and get a chainsaw and go cut it. I mean, we used to do that when I was a kid growing up, but there was, that wasn't something, an option for me. And one day, one day I came home and I looked at the lean-to on the side of our garage where we used to store the wood and it was full. And I was just like, what happened? Like, I was so blessed. I felt so blessed. And I'm going to tell you, this was a private need. I did not say one word to anybody about this. It was a private need. I prayed for it myself. I don't even think I talked to my wife about it. And I came home, you know, shortly after, you know, asking God this question, and here it's full. But what stood out to me in this instance was there was a pile of my junk next to the lean-to on the ground. And I realized I left it all inside there where we normally pack the wood. And then I, it dawned on me that I asked Jesus to provide wood I asked him to provide a miracle. I didn't ask him to provide wood. I asked him to find somebody who sell to me on the cheap. <laughs> but he provided wood. He took it that much, that much farther. And I was blessed by these friends who brought me wood. And then I realized, man, I asked God to provide me wood. And I didn't even empty the space where we put it. I didn't expect this to happen. And I was standing there. I was like, Pete, come on, man. You're better than this. You know better than this. And you say, well, don't be so hard on you. It's a bit of an oversight. But... Maybe it was, but still, man, if I want to ask God for something, I want to provide room for it in my life. If I need a car to get to work, I don't know if, I don't know if you got a driveway, but maybe you need to make space and say, God, this is where I'd like to park it. Not a Lamborghini. Get something practical, people. <laughs> I've been driving behind people in expensive cars this winter, and it's getting kind of frustrating. Put some winter tires in your car, for crying out loud. I was praying for provision. I was praying for a miracle, but I did not prepare for the provision. You know, I want you to hear that this morning. If you take anything from this this morning, take this. It says, when we pray for provision, we should prepare for it. We pray for a miracle, we should expect it. 
Like, I, I, I want this to be my life, that when I pray, I expect an answer. And, and it doesn't have to be the answer the way I look at it. I just want to be open to what God is saying to me. If he's telling me to use what I got, then I want to use what I got. She needed help. She needed to ask for it. She needed to act, and she needed to be obedient. And I know I've kind of touched this on, on this a little bit, but I want to double down on it a bit this morning. First of all, she was obedient, immediately obedient, with the instructions about the oil. I can only imagine what it must have looked like to her neighbors when this poor woman, this poor widow, was boring all these jars and bringing them into her house. And he said to do it in private, so he's bringing them in and shutting the door behind her. I'm going to tell you what would happen today. People would be like, George, what is she bringing all those jars into her house for? You know, they'd be like, I bet you I know what she's growing in those jars. You know what I mean? Like, people... This, this is what would be happening. Am I wrong? I mean, I don't think it was that different back then. They'd be like, what does she need all these jars for? She, he told her to go in and do it in private, so she's not broadcasting to them, well, I need it because the prophet told me. He said, no. He said, go in the house with you and your sons and shut the door behind you. And she did it. She went and got all these jars, and she brought them, brought them in the house in private. People peeking through their blinds, I can imagine. It must have been unusual behavior to behold, I'm sure. What in the world was this widow doing with all these jars, hoarding them in her house? But no matter how unusual the request was or how strange it would, have, uh, would make her or her son seem, she believed for a miracle in her circumstances and she was obedient to the instructions given her and she went and she did exactly what the prophet asked her to do. Secondly, she was obedient when she was instructed to pay her debt with the money. Have you had money to pay your debts and not paid your debts? I'm just saying. I don't know if it's just me again. <laughs> when this miracle was completed, there was nothing forcing her to pay her debts. She had all this oil in her possession and she could have sold it, ran off with it. Not well, all the oil, that would have been a lot to carry, but the money she made from the oil, but the strong implication in the language tells us that she did what Elijah told her to do exactly. And I'm sure that if she did not do what she had told her, we would have read more in Scripture about it. Because when people don't do what they're told, we're, we're read, we read about their consequences. Ananias and Sapphira, anybody with me? She was obedient to use... What was provided for the need, it was provided for. That is good stewardship. I'm challenged, I got to tell you, I'm challenged by this mother's actions today. And I hope you are too. In her time of need, she called on God via the prophet Elisha to help her and her sons. Not only that, but she accepted the answer given to her, even though I'm telling you, you put yourself in her situation, it's not the answer that most people would have wanted. It's not the answer most people would have expected. But not only that, she accepted the answer given her, and she was obedient to the task, the instructions that God had spoken to her through Elisha. She inspires me today. I'm telling you, I, I read this account, and I'm inspired. I'm reminded today that when I pray for provision, I need to prepare for it. I need to live an expectant life that God is going to be there when I need him to be there. And even when I don't need him, he's going to be there. And he's going to do things for me that I don't expect and don't, didn't know I needed. Because that's who God is, because he loves me that much. That's what we do for our kids when they're little, right? We go buy them clothes. They don't, need them. They don't know they need clothes. My son would wear the same pair of jogging pants with the knees wore out every day. And even now, he goes back to the same shirt that he's got a hole chewed in in the middle right here, that orange shirt. I wish we'd just throw it in the garbage. <laughs> but they don't know they need new clothes. We buy it for them, and we dress them. That's what Jesus does for us. That's what God does for us. He's doing things for us all the time we don't even know we need. We go to sleep at night, and we breathe, and we, and we take in oxygen all night through because God sustains us and keeps us. He, he is the author and the finisher of our faith, the sustainer of everything. And we take it for granted sometimes. We don't understand what he's doing when we're sleeping and when, we're, and when we don't see everything. How much more is he going to run to you when you ask? 
how much more is he going to speak to you and listen to you when you ask and you say, God, I'm here. I'm in a situation. I need you. So let's ask ourselves some questions in closing today. When we pray for a miracle, do we expect it? Do we prepare for it? Do we go collect the jars expecting them to be filled? I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what that resource you need blessed. Are we being good stewards with what God has already given us? That's the ouch question, right? One last question. Did you happen to notice when the oil stopped flowing? Did you notice when the oil stopped flowing? The oil stopped flowing when the vessels that she had provided were full. The prophet didn't drop off, you know, big thing to carry the oil. He said, you do it. You go get it. You go provide the vessel for the miracle that God is going to provide. And I'm going to tell you that, you know, if she would have brought more jars, God would have filled those too. But the oil stopped flowing when the vessel that she had provided was full. That sits with me today. I don't know how it makes you feel. When the room made available by her for the miracle was full, that's when the oil stopped floating, when the need was met. How much space have we provided for God's miracles in our lives and circumstances? How much space in our life do we give God to say, God, I need you, and, and, and I know and I'm believing that you're going to do this for me? I don't know. I want you to be brave with me this morning. If you need a miracle in your life, I want you to raise your hand. Let's go ahead, man. That's a lot of you. <laughs> now I want you to ask yourself, are you making room in your heart for Jesus to do something? I want you to take some time today. It's not something I think we can do right now, but I want you to take some time today and say, God, and, and, or this week, and just as you're in your devotion times, and pray and say, God, am I withholding my resources? Am I, do I have something in my life that you can use that I'm not acknowledging that you can take and you can bless to provide this miracle in my life? Just give them whatever you have. Give him your time. Give him your stuff. Give him your car. Give him your house. Just say, God, whatever it is, open my eyes to see it. If there's something that's here that you can bless that I already have, that I haven't. If there's a little bottle of oil here that you want to bless, Lord, show me. And I will provide the vessels for the miracle you have planned for me in my life. So you got some homework this week, amen? There's a lot of hands. That's accountability. Now, I'm not taking all your names and your phone numbers. Everybody say amen. But before God today, you said, I need a miracle. Let's do some inventory, amen? Let's say, God, what do I have in my life? What talent do I have? I went to a financial seminar at a, at a, at a, at a conference one time. And the first thing that the guy asked, I thought he was going to teach me how to manage my money so we could keep more of the money we were making. He said, no, what talents do you have? What can you use that you are not using, that you could, a talent that you have that you can make more money with? And I'm like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. What do you have that you can place in the hands of Jesus? Say, God, bless it. Use it. Whatever I have is yours. Whatever I am is yours. Whatever talent you've given me is yours. Bless it. Use it. And so I can bless others through it. Amen? I'm just going to pray and ask God to seal this word in our heart. And then Pastor, Pastor Earl's going to come and he's going to pass a benediction and pray for you today. Father, we love you, Lord. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you speak to us. And then in a world with over 7 billion people, oh God, you can come and make me feel like I'm your, like your son, your one and only son. You can make me feel like I'm your son, that I'm your, your only child, Lord. You can make me feel so important. When I just take time to spend it in your presence, I feel the presence of my Father. 
And Lord, just, just like when I needed something as a little boy and I would go ask my dad, go ask my mom, I want to come to you in the same way. I'm willing to work. I'm willing to use what I have. I'm willing to offer what I have, Lord, but we want to be able to come to you first of all and to sit at your feet to ask and to listen and see what you would say to us in these situations. Father, we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for you. And so today, oh God, I just pray with a heart of thank, thanksgiving, thankfulness for all that I have and all the blessings you've poured out upon us, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray that I wouldn't look, overlook those blessings, Lord, when I ask you. That I would say, Lord, all this, Lord, that I have is yours. Bless it. Use it for your kingdom. Open my eyes to see how I may use it for your kingdom. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, you saw the hands that lifted and said they need a miracle today. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I believe there's testimonies being created even right now. People are asking you, Lord, to meet a financial need, to meet a physical need. Lord, maybe someone here needs healing. Maybe someone, Lord, has been clad with depression and they're tired of it. And they say, God, I need to be done with this, Lord. I don't even know why I'm upset anymore. And Lord, I know that in the name of Jesus, there's a miracle waiting and there's a testimony that's waiting to be told, oh God, of the healing power and the, and the reforming power and the regenerative power of Jesus in their life, oh God. So Father, we open ourselves up to the miracle that you have for each one of us. And we speak it over this place today. God, we look forward to hearing the testimonies. And Lord Jesus, we'll give space to tell them, oh God. And we'll celebrate what you've done in our lives. So Lord, I pray you take the actions of this widow. Don't even know her name. <laughs> and you would seal it in our heart that we would be so obedient as she was that we would be willing to provide the space for the miracle that she did and that we would be able to offer you whatever it is we have and let you bless it. Father, we love you. We honor you. We bless you in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Pastor Earl, will you come? I think we should focus on as Pastor, Pastor Peter spoke he said the lady limited her blessing by the number of vessels that she brought but the, as the last vessel that she brought was filled the oil stopped flowing so let's, this morning as we pray let us not put a limit on what God will do for us let us ask God for what we need and we're going to pray today that God will fill the needs in our lives and we will make room as he said to receive God's blessing Father we thank you today for who you are we thank you today that you're our God, our Redeemer our Savior, our Lord we thank you today that you're the one who called us. And God, you're the one who filled the yearnings of our heart. Today, as a people, Lord, we reach out before you with all that we need. Some of us today, God, may be needing a job. Some of us it's for health reasons, financial reasons, for peace in our lives. You know the need in our lives today. And we reach out to you, God, and we say, Lord, fill the need of our hearts this morning. Our prayer and our cry to you, God, is to fill the longing of our hearts. 
Father, we pray today that even as your children, some of us, you are going to use to answer the prayers of others, even as Brooklyn was you be you've been used by God to help that woman who was in need. We pray, God, that as your people today, we'll be willing and open to you to be used by you to help those who have a need in their lives. This we pray today, God. Bless your people as we go this week. We pray, God, that you will cause us to be a blessing to all that we encounter in our communities, at our workplace, and in our homes. As we go today, God, we ask that you bless us and keep us. But you make your face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. But you lift up the light of your countenance upon us and give us your peace from this day forth and forevermore. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great week this week.